Laura ja. auch? Bitte? Uh, Laura und Laura, both fine. Laura, okay. Thank you, Laura uh, uh, Umtner. Uh, she's a literary scholar and digital humanist based in Vienna. Her research interests include the digital literary studies, the literary reception of Sappho, Arthur Schnitzler and Karl Kraus, as co-organizer of the reading series uh, Gläserne Text and um, as a board member of sorry uh, about my uh, German <laughs> pronunciation um, und ab abhängige Lesereien. Uf, sorry, she Perfect. also acts as a literary mediator uh, at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Laura is part of the research unit of literary and textual studies. She is a co-editor of the G digital scholarly edition of uh, Arthur Schnitzler. Uh, literary correspondences, and she is involved in several other Schnitzler projects of the Academy. Today, she will give an insight into her dissertation project on digital reception studies at the University of Vienna, which is based on her book about Sappho that was published earlier this year. So, Laura, you have the floor, but please could you pronounce correctly uh, the names of the series of the uh, um, uh, research team you make part? Please adjust uh, to improve my German pronunciation. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, the reading series is called Gläserne Text. Uh, um, Gläserne is something like uh, glass, uh, like a, a, a glass. Um, and texts, um, and uh, the other one is uh, independent, uh, unabhängige Lesereien, like independent uh, reading series, um, which is a network of independent uh, reading series in uh, the German-speaking area. Okay, thank you. I understand better. So, well, uh, yeah, no, set minutes, uh, it's enough. Ah, uh, Susan, it seems Zoom is not finding any camera like I see. I hear you. Okay, Susan Fandier uh, is with us. So, uh, welcome, Susan. Uh, Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for this uh, nice introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, as Amelia already said, uh, my primary uh, profession is editing biographical documents of Arthur Schnitzler at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, the dissertation project I'll be discussing today has nothing to do with Schnitzler. Um, my dissertation, currently supervised by Paula Wojcik at the University of Vienna, aims to form a new uh, subdiscipline of digital literary studies, namely digital reception studies, using the example of the literary reception of Sappho in the German speaking area. So, this is what I will focus on today. In the first part of my presentation, I will provide an overview of the literary reception of Sappho in the German-speaking area. In the second part, I will explain how I make this knowledge machine readable and by that um, creating a, a big digital network of literary texts that are um, particularly important for what is known as female and queer literary history. Um, but the reasons for this will hopefully become clear in the next few minutes. For those interested in um, classical philology, literary history, or just pop culture, Sappho um, will surely be a familiar name, whether it's uh, Ovid, Virginia Woolf, or maybe Taylor Swift. Sappho somehow resonates. Uh, she is globally known as a lesbian and feminist icon, uh, the epitome of the highest lyrical quality by women, and uh, she is known as the first poetess known to us today. Yet, um, beside these aspects, we know next to nothing. To provide you with an approximate um, understanding of Sappho and the object of uh, reception under examination, let's start with a few words about her biography and her work. 
It is believed that um, Sappho lived in the 7th and 6th centuries before our time in ancient Greece on the island of Lesbos. She probably had uh, three brothers and a daughter named Clays. Um, perhaps she was the leader of a group of girls or women where music, um, fashion, poetry, beauty and femininity were highly valued. Along with love, marriage and sexuality, these are also the main topics in, in Sampho's work. It is assumed, which is especially significant for modern receptions, that Sappho not only shared friendly or educational relationships with the women and girls around her, but also had romantic ties with them. But um, there is also the widespread legend that due to her unrequited love for the young, beautiful ferryman uh, Phaeon, Sappho leaped from the so-called Leucadian cliff and uh, committed suicide, indicating the possibility of heterosexual love relationships as well. This, um, <clears throat> this image of Sappho's leap, despite uh, lacking factual basis, like much in her reception history, quickly became um, iconic and can now even be found on the cover of my book, um, already mentioned, um, published earlier this year. In Sappho's poems, of which only about 200 uh, fragments have reached us today, there are almost exclusively um, female figures, possibly students and friends, or perhaps entirely fictional personas. Um, Sappho, who sometimes even mentions her, her own name, or, or rather the lyrical I, speaks to them about love, fashion, beauty, art, and similar matters. Especially known uh, Sappho's love poems and the suffix stanza named after her, one poem that has been particularly frequently um, productively received in German literature is fragment 31 in Anne Carson's um, very liberal translation, it sounds as follows. He seems to me equal to God's that man, whoever he is who opposite you sits and listens close to your sweet speaking. And lovely laughing, oh it, puts the heart in my chest on wings. For when I look at you, even a moment, no speaking is left in me. No tongue breaks and thin, fire is racing under skin. And in eyes, no sight and drumming fills ears. And cold sweat holds me and shaking grips me all. Greener than grass, I am dead and dead or almost I seem to me. But all is to be dared because even a person of poverty. So much for now about um, Sappho's life and work today. The focus is supposed to be more on the reception history, um, which also means bridging the gaps uh, Sappho's life and work provide. Um, a key term for my research is that of productive literary reception. By productive literary reception testimonies, I mean literary texts containing elements of a received text, um, such as the adoption of characters and motives, style imitations, paraphrases, but also fictionalizations of authors. Preceding the productive literary reception testimony, as I understand it, is a reception process resulting almost every time in an intertextual literary text. Altogether, I'm now familiar with around 1,000 uh, literary texts from the German-speaking area from the 15th to the 21st century, in which Sappho is productively received. I um, personally discovered approximately 800 of these texts through rather painstaking research, but uh, the remainder has already been mentioned in uh, academic publications. In the reception testimonies, uh, Sappho reappears as a figure, her poems are quoted and paraphrased and motives from them are taken up again. Biographical, bi biographical theories and uh, legends, for example, the, the previously mentioned Sappho Feyon legend, her um, presumed homoerotic relationships, and her role as a cult, choir, or group leader are reproduced, expanded, but also deconstructed. 
The texts also focus on individuals from Sappho's presumed environment and, um, for example, refer to earlier reception testimonies, thereby weaving an, an intertextual net with them. To um, better understand the dynamics in the German-speaking um, reception history, we must begin by taking a look at antiquity. Even then, Sappho was known as a great poetess. She was a role model for uh, poems, poets, grammarians, and uh, rhetoricians. She was called the 10th Muse and the female Homer, and she was already included in the canon. Even then, Sappho was seen as an ancestor for female poets. It was also in antiquity that the Sappho Feyan legend was born, um, presumably in Attic comedy, where Sappho was often portrayed as a passionate and to some extent a, a hypersexual woman to counterbalance this image in the third century BC, a so-called um, second Sappho was invented. So very early on, there were two main images of Sappho, the great poetess and the passionately loving one. In the Middle Ages, especially Ovid's reception of Sappho was influential. One can see how um, the reception testimonies influence each other. Ovid, or maybe not Ovid, it's debated whether he's truly the author, but someone, and we refer to this someone now as Ovid, in the first century AD, in the form of an epistle, reworked um, the Sappho Feyan legend and described Sappho as a bisexual woman. This text um, became incredibly famous over time and uh, fundamentally shaped the reception of Sappho. These two images um, known from Ovid, Sappho as an unhappily uh, passionate heterosexual lover who commits suicide due to unrequited love, and Sappho as a non-normatively desiring woman are particularly present in the literature of um, the Middle Ages and throughout the whole literary history. Besides Ovid in the Middle Ages, um, the Italian reception of Sappho influenced the German one from this side as um, from France, especially the image of Sappho as a great poetess emerge. Um, in consequence, from the, the late 16th century onwards, Sappho increasingly became a role model and reference point for female poets. But due to the influence of Ovid and others, she also became a negative example of a sexually deviant woman or an excessively um, passionate poetess. To put it in, in one sentence, um, the ambiguity of the Sappho image persisted. Beginning with the first German language translation of Sappho by Philipp von Ziesen in 1656, um, German translations of Sappho flourished, especially in the 18th century. Also, German language and Sappho research slowly replaced the former French predominance in this field. Then Sappho became um, also significantly more present in German language literature and uh, through Klopstock and, and others, also the suffix dancer gained more prominence. Sappho was then brought into the present. This also meant updating her persona. So uh, Sappho became a, a bürgerliches, a, a bourgeois romantic concept, symbolizing more the spirit of the time of reception than that of um, the time of antiquity. She was um, the epitome of the conflict uh, between art and life. She is the one who gives up art for life, uh, for love. She is the one who, who leaves from the Lucadian cliff because she cannot combine the two worlds, cannot love, uh, live, and create art simultaneously. Anna Luisa Karsch could identify with this tragic life. She is the German speaking poetess uh, most frequently associ associated with Sappho and was called German Sappho even in her lifetime in the 18th century. I now know about 120 poems in which she refers to herself as Sappho or in some other way um, references her. There is still no other person from whom there are so many testimonies of productive literary reception of Sappho. In addition to um, the image of Sappho as a great poetess in the 18th century, she was more and more also explicitly associated with female homosexuality in the German-speaking area. 
subfic or um, subfish gradually became a synonym for same-sex desiring. And at the latest in the 19th century, Sappho was no longer just a symbol of poetry, but also became a symbol for um, female homosexuality, a notion that um, persists even today when we think of terms like lesbian or subfic in contemporary language usage. This, of course, um, stirred controversy and so-called um, defense attempts were necessary, as seen already in the 18th century with um, Herder and others. Even in the 19th century, Sappho was still primarily two things, a moral, asexual, virtuous woman, and yet also a very sexual, emancipated, perhaps same-sex desiring woman. According to the spirit of the times, the tragic um, heterosexual Sappho legend was, of course, um, predominant most of the time and um, found a particularly large audience in the early 19th century, especially with uh, Grillparzer's play Sappho. Mm, I can't entirely explain the development towards that point, um, but in the 19th century, Sappho was also increasingly perceived as a teacher. When I consider what moral or um, political intentions might possibly lie behind the texts, um, primarily imagine Sappho as a teacher, then the only logical conclusion, conclusion so far seems to be that this image of Sappho as a teacher was and is uh, mostly another strategy to portray Sappho as morally virtuous. After all, a teacher um, primarily serves um, pedagogical, valuable um, functions. So by um, the end of the 19th century, we have all major biographical theories that can still be found in literary texts today. Sappho as a great poetess, as a teacher in some form, such as the leader of a school, a choir leader, a cult leader, or something similar, and Sappho as a tragically loving woman and a homoerotically homo desiring woman. Then, um, only at the end of the 19th century, almost all of the fragments known to us, to us today were found in Egypt. Therefore, in the 20th century, um, Sappho's work and its materiality, the, the fragmentary nature, became a more interesting subject for literary texts. Poetry um, now became the most important genre in the German-speaking literary reception of Sappho. It takes up all sorts of uh, known theories and legends about Sappho and works intensely um, intertextually with Sappho's work and other reception testimonies. In 2014 and 2021, even two anthologies were published, mainly consisting of poems and ex exclusively gathering um, productive literary reception testimonies related to Sappho. But it's worth noting um, these were commissioned works. Mm, coming to the end of the first part, I'd like to highlight a more recent dramatic work because it represents um, the the current image of Sappho quite well. And I'd also like to um, briefly share an anecdote about an encounter that I found particularly beautiful uh, while, working on, while working on my book. Um, by, by sheer chance, I have to say, I, I stumbled upon the play Sappho und alle, die danach kamen, which can be translated as Sappho and all who followed. Um, the play premiered at the Lesbian Theatre Munich in 1978. It involved a, a group of amateur actresses, some of whom unfortunately are no longer alive today. But after a while, I, I managed to reach one of the former participants. I asked her if I could publish an excerpt um, from the play in my book. She, she was quite happy about um, this request, but particularly um, because it gave her an opportunity to reconnect with her old friends. Um, we then exchanged emails for several weeks and she kept me updated on her progress and reunions, uh, sharing old stories, um, including a show in Amsterdam. With this anecdote, it's not surprising what's coming next. In the 21st century today, Sappho is primarily uh, a lesbian and feminist icon known as the first poetess and lesbian. Um, but there is still a tendency towards an ambivalent image of Sappho even today, um, extremely 
virtuous or defensive images of Sappho persist. And um, probably mainly due to the um, increased rediscovery of female authors in recent years, there are currently more lit literary reception testimonies related to Sappho than ever before. So it remains exciting to see how the reception history will continue to evolve in the coming years. But um, why all this? Uh, initially, I, I came to Sappho because I got the impression that her reception testimony, uh, reception history is of particular uh, significance and can be used to analyze various aspects, be it social or intertextual or whatever. For myself, I, I discovered Sappho as a topic in, in literary history with great social relevance. And only then um, did I realize that this had not been um, comprehensively explored yet. In short, um, I've, I can't seem to move away from the topic now, but that's okay. Uh, a significant amount of the time I spend on my Sappho research and Wolf's um, literary texts from different times and cultures texts uh, significant for female and queer literary history, for questions about uh, the representation of women, um, bisexuals and lesbians in literature, or moving a bit away from, from the social aspect, texts with uh, very complex intertextual relationships. Um, I often encounter female authors referred to as new subfors or who referenced Sappho as a role model, yet they themselves were completely forgotten. Sappho is not only the first poetess we seem to know of, uh, she is one of the most important figures in Western European literary history, and her reception history is that of many um, female authors. Okay, before I starting the second part, I have to drink some water. And I think someone someone is writing in the chat. Can I ignore that? No. 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 Okay. Think it's okay. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Um, okay. So I would now like to start the second part of the lecture with an example, a text. As you can see, um, Sappho's name is explicitly mentioned in it in various forms. Reference is also made to um, biographical theories and legends about Sappho. On the one hand, the idea of Sappho as a great poet, and on the other hand, the Sappho Feyon legend. What we can also say about the text, it is a poem. Um, the author is Ernst Jandl. The poem was not written after 2000, and it was first published in 2001 in the collection Letzte Gedichte. So this is an example of a productive literary reception of Sappho. The knowledge um, just described about the poem could be expressed in a prosaic, um, non-formalized manner. I did this uh, to some extent already in my book, However, I could also capture this knowledge in a way that is machine readable, moving from unstructured to structured data. Comparable efforts in data and knowledge modeling already exist in intertextuality studies, but there they often use a very narrow um, lexical concept of intertextuality, which means a focus on quotations and paraphrases, and less what I also want to capture in a machine readable form like references to biographical legends, fictionalizations of authors, motive adoptions, and so forth. Also, despite um, the growing relevance of digital humanities in recent years and the um, rather urgent um, considerations about the intersections of computer science and literary studies, there are primarily works focused on linguistic and philological aspects. So some areas of literary studies still remain largely unexplored. And one of these is um, reception studies. While some researchers have already delved deeply um, into the related field of digital intertextuality studies, there hasn't yet been a comprehensive study explicitly dedicated to digital reception studies. 
This also means um, that digital reception studies differ from traditional analog um, reception studies, not only in terms of the media used in their tools and research environments. Fundamentally, uh, one, one needs to consider from the ground up about how literary reception phenomena can be captured, captured in a machine readable format and what happens um, with the underlying concepts and terms largely influenced by analog liter literary studies. As an example, and by now it's uh, probably clear, I look at the literary reception of Sappho in the German speaking world. Um, the reception of Sappho has been particularly um, examined since the 20th century, even more in the Anglo-American and Francophone areas in recent decades. The most um, significant research findings in the German speaking literary reception of Sappho can uh, currently be found in my master's thesis and in my book, um, which includes 102 primary texts and a quite extensive afterward. Um, my dissertation, which will be the first comprehensive um, methodological work on digital reception studies, focuses on how knowledge about productive literary reception can be modeled as linked data and thereby um, be prepared for the semantic web. The guiding assumption is that for a profound and a sustainable machine readable modeling of complex connections as they manifest in, in literary reception phenomena, complex data models such as ontologies are necessary. It is also possible, for instance, uh, with um, keyworded um, digital bibliographies or hierarchical XML encodings to capture metadata and, and to integrate links to norm data on, on persons, uh, works, and, and digital, digital texts. However, these forms of metadata do not extend into the machine-readable semantic do domain that makes ideal use of norm data in an age of interoper interoperability and uh, programming interfaces. Also, um, they enable only less complex expressions and um, analysis of triple-based data and especially the, the network-like relations among entities can better grasp only implicitly existing knowledge. And lastly, um, by, by modeling metadata in the strict logic of um, triples or an ontology, one can better um, counteract blind spots in the analysis. Because of the aspired um, fundamental methodological work, the use of text corpora and digital editions for reception studies is also discussed, but only on a theoretical level. Also, um, Boolean operators and filtering options, tools like the Google Ngram viewer, text recognition methods, as well as um, keyword and context analysis and, and similar things are addressed. Aspects of data and knowledge modeling are also discussed by um, using the example of XML, TI, XPath, and named entity recognition. Concerning the analysis of literary texts, methods such as topic modeling, sentiment analysis, um, computer-assisted stylometric methods, and network analysis are introduced, especially regarding their usefulness for reception studies. These um, theoretical chapters propose computer-assisted means to um, generate knowledge about and to find literary reception evidence, so potential resources and methods that could assist um, digital reception studies in modeling knowledge about already known texts as linked data or um, precede such modeling. Two brief examples to give you a sense of it. Here you can see um, how the result of an analysis of the reception of SAPFO using topic modeling might look like. Um, Topic modeling enables the recognition of topics in literary texts, for example, uh, love sickness, a central topic in the history of the literary reception of Sappho. Typical words can be associated with these topics as seen in the upper right, and the documents can also be arranged according to the topics as seen in the lower right. As a second example, um, the Google Engram viewer 
this tool um, displays how frequently, for example, Sappho is mentioned in books available on Google Books. Um, and this is possible, as shown in this example, to compare the um, corpora in different languages. Um, this provides a first overview of the intensity of the reception at a certain time in a specific language. The focus is, as already mentioned, on the productive literary reception of literary texts, works, um, and authors, so texts by so-called executing readers. Consequently, um, unlike in reception aesthetics, um, the focus is text-centric, so, so I will focus on traces of um, reception processes in literary texts, not on um, the readers or authors themselves. How do I do that? Um, alongside um, established ontologies like uh, CDOC CRM and Fabru, the OWL ontology intro is key. Intro was originally developed by Bernhard Oberreiter for describing intertextual phenomena, but it is also suitable for modeling knowledge about literary reception because reception phenomena are, as I already, already said, generally um, intertextual phenomena. One example, um, an interpretament um, identifies an intertextual relationship between the expression fragment of Sappho's fragment one and Franz uh, Grillparzer's tragedy Sappho, meaning that Sappho is a productive literary testimony of, of Sappho's fragment one. The specific passage supporting this relationship can be referenced with a text passage. It can also be expressed that the play contains a fictionalization of Sappho and um, incorporates um, the idea of Sappho as a great poetess, as well as the Sappho Feyan legend. Also, um, other reception testimonies referencing to Grillparzer's um, Sappho can be linked. So the concept of intertextuality in intro is not strictly lexical, enabling the modeling of not only classic um, intertexts like quotes and paraphrases, but also semantic features such as uh, character and motive adoptions. In total, um, my data set, as I already said, contains more than 1000 literary reception testimonies. Around 200 of them um, have already been mentioned in scientific texts, but um, a complete um, cataloging of the texts will for the first time uh, document all reception testimonies in one place. As a result, um, the German language literary reception of Sappho will be um, explored as um, extensive um, as never before and simultaneously captured in a machine readable form. But um, only um, 100 exemplary texts will be, detail uh, will be modeled in, in more detail and this will serve as an in-depth um, testing of the approach for literary studies. For modeling knowledge about the literary reception of Sappho, a SCOS taxonomy is created. This um, structured collection of uh, normalized terms for abstracted uh, phenomena in reception testimonies is linked uh, wherever possible to norm data. The taxonomy contains um, character names, motives, themes, and stoffe subjects recurrently found in reception testimonies like um, Aphrodite, for example. The focus on uh, repeatedly occurring phenomena primarily arises from the assumption that a literary text does um, not have a predetermined meaning, um, but receives it from its reading instances. So the potential scope of meaning is uh, more or less infinite, but in any case, uh, too big to serve as a basis for meta classifications. The um, inductive approach has the same background. It is assumed that there is no adequate or correct productive literary reception. So it is unclear how the reception will manifest in literature beforehand. It is also important that the, um, that the phenomena in the texts have to be relatively explicit this focus on explicitness um, arises from the aim to design um, foundations of digital reception studies that should be as adaptable as possible, particularly for studies that go beyond um, the modeling of knowledge about literary reception phenomena as linked data. 
And as computers can currently primarily detect um, relatively visible phenomena like direct quotes, um, paraphrases, as well as character and motive adoptions, I have to um, start there. Um, the project um, concludes with a printed thesis and a collection of digital data provided um, in a freely accessible repository and made available in a triple store. The digital data will contain the modeling of the German language literary reception of SAPFO as linked data and the taxonomy for the literary reception of SAPFO. So everything will be um, open source and a static website for publishing uh, preliminary research findings. Um, initially, this is an, an, an index um, containing productive literary reception testimonies of SAPFO from the German speaking area. Um, this website is to be released soon. So um, in summary, my aim is to build um, foundations for digital reception studies based especially on um, insights um, from digital intertextuality studies. This involves um, the creation of um, a new subdiscipline of digital literary studies. The focus is now primarily on the aspect of data modeling using linked data, ontologies, taxonomies, and norm data. I assume that we at first um, need a good data model, and this exemplary ontology is created using the example of SAPFO. Um, this will result um, in a big digital network of literary texts, particularly important for the so-called uh, female and queer literary history, showcasing um, the literary legacy of the um, first um, poetess in a machine readable form. That's all from uh, me from for now. I've talked quite a bit already, uh, so I'm really looking forward to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we have a, um, a number of questions. I'm sure that Susan uh, has a number of questions, perhaps. If you cannot use uh, your micro, you can write in the chat your questions. Because my, my first question deals with the difference uh, between the reception and circulation. But when we you, you speak about reception, what's what exactly reception uh, for you? What's the difference between, once again, uh, reception and circulation? Because reception is a, a very a, a German concept. So there's a yeah. huge tradition of uh, reception studies from uh, Jules and uh, Isar and uh, so mm -hmm. on and so on. So yes, um, you told us several times uh, productive uh, just, uh, reception studies and productive uh, testimonies. And uh, at the same time, at the end, you spoke about semantic features, so mm -hmm. as uh, intertextual uh, kind of uh, productive uh, reception. And so, uh, yeah, it is very well. Uh, I need uh, uh, a definition of uh, semantic features uh, too, and uh, a way to uh, identify semantic features of, uh, as a, a reception testimony. So, well, uh, Two questions. Uh, the difference between reception and uh, circulation, uh, your own definition of reception, and uh, why to include the semantic features uh, as uh, intertextual productive reception, reception, how to identify semantic features. Okay. Um, well, it depends on your. Um definition of circulation of course um but um as i um as i said um in in my lecture i define um productive literary reception um, um as as texts that uh, contain um elements from a received text so um or also um from a received work or an author so um there hasn't uh, there's it's not necessary that uh, an author um, has read a specific text before but they somehow uh, received it 
and then they productively um, did something with this element, um, be it the offer, be it um, a motive, um, something that can be traced back to this text, to uh, work, to the author. Um, so this is what I mean with productive literary reception, which, it, which is not a really common term um, in literary studies, mm -hmm. like I think anywhere, um, because it's it's it, it's a problem that um, the the um, you, if you you probably um, or I I struggle with um, differentiating intertextuality and um, productive um, reception because um, there are so many concepts of intertextuality that it's more or less impossible to say like this is an intertext um, but this is an intertext according to hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I try to um, to avoid this um, discussion and um, use another term um, that includes as um, that, that includes um, lexical concepts of intertextuality, but also um, semantic uh, ones, because for example, our fictionalizations of authors are some kind of an intertext because um, reception testimonies or reception processes work like lit literary texts. Um, so the, the text of the reception history itself um, is received. Mm. So um, this kind of is intertextuality, but not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, we have a question from Susan, I think, in the chat. Yes. Um, so Susan writes, thanks, uh, Laura. I think it would be interesting to compare between your ways of proceeding and our larger scale approach in the new women writers database. I just sent a link to Katya, okay, <laughs> showing what kind of reception traces for Sappho are in there. Some hundred of them, no German ones, but both passive and active. I would love to take a look. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you consider the possibility of enlarging your research at a European scale? And uh, <laughs> the active but uh, passive too. Yes, I did. A, a pan-European uh, uh, sky, not just so the canonical countries. Yes, but that would be a, a, a really, really big uh, research project, um, and that's not that's not possible for one person. I tried to uh, cover the, the uh, milestones of the European uh, reception history in my master's thesis, and that was kind of crazy, I have to say, um, especially because um, the, the, the reception history in, in um, French, uh, in France and uh, Italy is, is really um, massive. Oh, wow, there's a screen now. Um, and why but... not? Yeah, sorry. Why not to try an ERC grant? So why not to applicate to to apply for it, for an ERC grant? Because it is, uh, I think, it is the the right way, well, uh, a possible way, um, um, and a very interesting uh, subject. What so? It would be amazing, but I'm still doing my PhD, so I think in a few years maybe. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we have on screen now the uh, Sappho data on uh, the new women writers database. Uh, you know perhaps that we are not working no longer in this version of the database because we are transferring all the data and even, and even the data model from a Huygens Institute to Radboud University. So uh, right now the database is frozen, but we are um, working hard in a new version that will be open in a year, uh, more or less. But all the work uh, uh, is uh, done by Susan and her team is there, as you can see. 
Very interesting. And so many of us have never heard of. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And, and you said no comprehensive study about digital reception mm -hmm. uh, studies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little uh, more about, because this is our subject. We are working on not a comprehensive study, but it, it is uh, our main uh, field of, uh, uh, of research. So uh, mm -hmm. digital reception studies. Mm -hmm. so, but not in a methodological way. No. Yeah. No. So there's there's nothing like not a you you can't look up um, methods that you could use for reception studies um, and digital humanities. There's no such thing like that. There are probably I think three or maybe four um, um, articles um, that that use um, the term um, reception studies and um, digital humanities in some way, but um, they 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 uh, don't really um, elaborate on, on methodological questions. Hmm. Okay, I agree with you, Yeah, yeah. Uh, It should be uh, the, the field of uh, a book if we uh, succeed, uh, success uh, if, if we are successful because we we would like to publish a volume in uh, the, the Brill collection about these questions perhaps not a comprehensive uh, a study but uh, a bundle of uh, methodological examples of how to do it yeah that's really nice yeah yeah um I, and yeah yeah another question um how did you find all these receptions in german uh, language or literature um <laughs> um uh, databases uh, mostly um uh, library catalogs um um uh, online newspaper archives uh, it it was hours and hours of work uh, because i had to look at every hit um, that was something like Subfo or Subfish or something similar. Um, but yeah, now I have 1,000 texts and I even found a, a few novels um, that I think nobody knows um, yet. But yeah, it's also a lot. Well, uh, if, uh, in the uh, German area, uh, yes, in the German area, in a very uh, large, uh, with a very large scope, so German area from uh, uh, Germany to uh, the north of Italy and uh, yes, Austria, of course, and okay. Yeah, you could even live in the US and write in German, that's fine too. Okay. Okay. This is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Julie Oliveira. Yes, I have a question. Um, my master's thesis was about intertextuality productions and rewritings of Sappho by female poets and lesbians in the 20th century. So I, I, nice. I, I still, I'm still working in this, uh, in this subject, but in a transnational context. Uh, so France, Portugal, and Brazil. So mm -hmm. it's just a question. It's not about the database because I'm not working with the uh, technology and stuff. But uh, are there any women translating Sappho in the Renaissance or modern times in German, um, I don't know, German-speaking areas, uh, Germany or Yes, there Austria, are, because... but only a few, um, like uh, mm -hmm. Luisa Rigunde Gottschied, um, but she's the only one coming to my mind right now. I have to look it up, but there are not many. Yeah, so we don't have a figure of the translator of Sappho as we have in no. France. Yeah, okay. and this year, no, we don't have that, yeah. Okay, and I just a comment, I really loved what you said about that Sappho's reception story is the story of many female authors, and that's exactly the process that I'm seeing, like I see it in René Vivien reception in, in France, uh, but also Judith Teixeira, if there are people who know mm -hmm. Portuguese, in Portuguese literature here. Is the same that happens, and also this condensation of the persona, uh, this the saint and the whore, and all the, the 
discourses that uh, are made from are based in it. So really interesting work. Um, congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, Laura, you said that the first uh, German translation uh, was published in uh, 1656. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so in the middle of the 17th century, so it is the, the precious period in France. So uh, your hypothesis, why uh, the first translation of Sappho in 1656? Um, Exactly the year I, I can't I can't comment on it on the year exactly, but it was um, a time when um, the French uh, productive uh, or no just the French uh, reception of Sappho in, in arts in literature in science was massive and uh, German uh, scholars really yeah try to um, connect with with the French uh, research and, and translation that was going on. So I think they kind of wanted to to be as good as um the french people and uh Sappho was important for uh french philologists so i think that's that's the main reason for this time mm -hmm. and your sorry, your scots taxonomy is published in github is available in github your uh, scots uh, taxonomy not yet not okay. yet because because it's a work in process and it's changing all the time and i don't really want to publish something that's going to be different uh, a few hours later okay yeah because we should uh, i think we would be very interested in uh, comparing uh, our taxonomy our categories our new categories with your uh, uh taxonomy so yeah, i would love uh, to, to see uh, i would love to see your um, ontology or, or taxonomy so what do you what do you have yeah okay perhaps perhaps uh, you could come to ljubljana in january <laughs> to share well uh, with us so ljubljana is not so far from uh, vienna uh, from uh, austria <laughs> why not so to be fair Luke. okay yeah maybe you could send me the details yeah yeah, so something else to add to this very interesting uh, presentation, really interesting. And uh, um, I'm happy to feel uh, useful because uh, Julie Oliveira is there, because Alva is there, because Susan is there. So wonderful to uh, bring, uh, to bridge the gap. And, uh, and and to build bridges between uh, um, PhD candidates and young researchers and uh, senior researchers. Uh, so today, I think uh, we had uh, uh, done a good job. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. And we uh, so uh, our presentation will be published and available for everybody in a few days. And uh, Laura, we keep in contact. Uh, Julie, we keep in contact. Please send us uh, your email address uh, in order to send you uh, new messages. Uh, uh, you make part of a new uh, list. So you uh, will receive more uh, information, uh, but please send us your uh, email to, uh, to keep in contact. OK, Julie Silva. Julie Silva. Um, Sarva Novella. Okay. Uh, okay, Katia, hey, something uh, else? Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps we could announce our next webinar for those who have not received uh, your mail. So uh, yes, yeah, I have I have to confirm. Get... Yeah, uh, so the the next series of seminars from January to May, it is more or less confirmed. I will send you uh, in a few days. So the first one will take pl place in Ljubljana, the 27th, 
more or less uh, January, uh, if I remember correctly. So face to face and online, of course, and after at the end of February, March, April, and May. Uh, we are uh, waiting for a new proposal for June until the year will be completed uh, and full of proposals. So yes, I will send you a, 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 a schedule for the next year uh, as soon as possible in a few in a few days, I promise. And we will post it on our Sipus uh, Women Writers in History Net um, account. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, okay. the program. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, see you soon. We keep in contact. Uh, thank you. It was a, a beautiful experience. Excellent. Thank you, Laura, and congratulations, of course. Keep on working. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>